We do bless God for all of the worship planners, for those who put effort and sweat to the worship music team. Thank you so much. I know that you don't sound like that unless somebody puts some rehearsal in. <laughs> to President David Millot, who calls you in January when you're not even thinking about such things. <laughs> Before you can get your mind organized, I said yes. And I walk in, and Bishop Flunder and Dr. Lee, and I'm like, wait a minute. These folks are supposed to be doing the preaching, not I. <laughs> it is uh, great to honor um, these graduates, the faculty, and so much of our administration, our CTS staff team. This is a day of celebration for everybody, for all of the efforts and the sweats and the, the tears. And I'm supposed to be reading the scripture, but since... The scripture is so long, it's actually one verse. <laughs> I thought I'd blend it all together, have a word of prayer, and then Dr. Leah Gunning Francis, thank you so much. I'm still mad at her for leaving, so that just hit me while I'm in it. <laughs> I gotta pray and get that spirit out of me. So. Would you bow with me in just a word of prayer? And so, God, we thank you now for this opportunity, this moment of joy and celebration. Thank you for the movement of your Holy Spirit in this place called CTS. Thank you for the partnerships between students and teachers, between administration and staff, and faculty, and all the people, board or trustees, all they that have labored that we might have this celebration. God, now the preacher, God, for if you don't speak, there's nothing the preacher can say. You don't move, there's nothing the preacher can feel. If you don't anoint, there's nothing that's going to happen in this sermon, God, so you get the glory. What we're after, most of all, is a blessing. And we thank you in Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. This morning's text, afternoon's text, is taken from John in the 14th chapter and the 31st verse, and it simply reads, Arise, let us go hence. Now, I know that uh, the King James Version is a much aligned biblical version that many of us have cast aside for preaching altogether. But there's something about the poetry of the King James Version that yet has a value in my life, and every now and then I enjoy. So the, the modern translation out of um, the NIV simply says, come now, let us leave. That doesn't quite have the punch <laughs> of arise, let us go hence. Our brief text for today is centered in what many scholars have regarded as the farewell discourse. It includes John 13 through 17, where Jesus is wrapping up his final teachings with his disciples and preparing them for his departure and the offering of the farewell prayer that concludes the farewell discourses, the farewell discourse in chapter 17. In my estimation, Professor Jesus has graded all the papers, turned the grades into the registrar, and now that the graduation date has been set, he prepares for the final moments with them as their commencement will be at Calvary. Some scholars have divided the farewell discourses into four sections. Uh, in my words, four final lectures. <laughs> Today is the first lecture that runs from John 13, 31 through John 14, 31. And of course, if I was the pastor, I'd preach the other three in the next three Sundays and I'd have a series. <laughs> but this first lecture concludes with arise and let us go hence. 
six days before the Passover, the run-up to the final lectures is gripping and begins in chapter 12 where Mary anoints his feet with her hair. Five days before Calvary, he goes to Jerusalem, rides on a donkey. The people wave palm branches and sing Hosanna. People come from everywhere and the religious leaders decide that it is time for Jesus to die for as they say, the whole world is following after him. Jesus then teaches about his death in chapter 13. He washes the disciples' feet. He predicts his betrayal. He gives a new commandment that they love one another as I have loved you. He comes back to the betrayal and then tells Peter, yeah, you will die for me, but first you're going to betray me. Because he knows his departure is imminent and he knows that they are about to graduate at Calvary, he offers comfort. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in, I go to prepare a place. He goes over all the things he has taught them, a kind of final review and summation, if you will, a kind of uh, synopsis and conclusion of all lessons presented. He says, I will ask the Lord and he will give you another counselor, the spirit of truth. He says, if anybody loves me, they will obey my teachings. Again, he's summarizing. He finishes this first lecture and then says, arise, let us go hence. What is clear, though, is that they are in the shadow of tragedy. When, when they begin, uh, when they commence, when they leave graduation, they would face some ominous and despicable threats. When Professor Jesus is no longer visibly present, they will preach that Jesus has come to give life and yet there will be death. They are asked to believe that the relationship with Christ remains despite the fact that they no longer visibly see him. They will proclaim peace to a world that knows only war, love to a people, even the church that has the proclivity to hate. And he knows that they will be persecuted. In summation, Jesus' basic message is, I prepared a place for you. The Holy Spirit will come to guide and instruct. You can live the life of faith in the context of any number of things that threaten your faith. I leave you with my peace, not as the world gives, but I leave you my peace so you don't have to be troubled and you don't have to be afraid. This is the overall message out of this first lecture, but I want to pull out three thoughts that we might think about uh, to encourage the graduates that you might have peace and not be afraid. First, uh, though Jesus is departing and you all are departing here, they had a relationship with an impactful instructor. They walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus. They spent three years with Jesus, and those three years had changed their lives. They spent three years with the best instructor uh, of any school, of any PhD program, anything else. They had three years. They had an eventful relationship with an impactful instructor. I think many of y'all sitting right here can say with me that you have had an eventful relationship with an impactful instructor. Several, if not uh, only one, but several instructors have impacted you, have changed you, have opened you, have helped you, have mentored you, has taken time with you. Even some of us prophesy over some of you all. <laughs> Pulled out the best in you and helped you to see a future that you might not have been able to see for yourself. Many of us are leaving here, and we're not the same way as what we came in. We have grown and developed and blossomed, 
We've had an eventful relationship with an impactful instructor, administrator, fellow students, CTS body, the trustee board, the dean, whoever, somebody somewhere in this place had an eventful relationship with an impactful person. So let me go black church on you. Do I have anybody in here who would be willing to put their hands together and celebrate the impactful professors, the administrators, the staff, the board of trustees? Come on, y'all. Do I have anybody in here? Anybody that's been impactful, anybody that changed you and altered you and helped you and loved you and healed you, anybody. (laughs) Straight black church, all right. Secondly, there was a presence who brought you here, kept you while you were here, will be with you when you leave here and throughout your life and entire ministry. Jesus is clear about the role of the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the comforter. The role of the Holy Spirit is to come alongside us for aid and help and guidance and instruction and revelation in all truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who encourages, uplifts, and refreshes who intercedes on our behalf as an advocate in court. Jesus teaches them and talks to them about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's amazing in our academic and our um, hermeneutics, uh, even our preaching classes and all of our systematics, all of our hermeneutics, all that stuff, our pastoral care, our counseling, we sometimes forget about the role of the Holy Spirit. There is somebody who will guide us into all truth. I remember, I remember when I was in seminary, I was lost in my thought process on several papers that I had to produce. And when you're lost on your thought process, you certainly locked up on your writing process. And when I was in seminary, Scott, they had something they don't have anymore. They had something called stacks. You know, and, and stacks were where the books, six or seven floors. You know, there was no internet. There was no internet library. You had to go to the stacks. And strategically in the stacks, they would place tables where you could study. And oftentimes, the stacks were the most quiet place in the library. I was stuck. I went to the stacks. When I got stuck, I'd go to the stacks. And when I got up there, I was stuck. And, and you know, the papers got to get due. I'm trying to graduate. I got a family. I'm trying to work my little job. I'm trying everything. I'm overwhelmed. I'm totally collapsed. I'm ready to quit. About to give this thing up. And something says, go over there. So I get up and I go over kind of to the corner in the stacks. It said, kind of turn right here. And all of a sudden, it says, browse this. And I look up and down and I see a book. I open that book. And it has a key that unlocks my thinking. I write the paper. I'm, well, tempted to think that it was my genius that pulled this together. (laughs) In fact, it was the Holy Spirit. Guiding and directing. Go here, go there, open this, open that. Has that ever happened to anybody in here? Go here, go there, go there. You don't know why. You got to urge. You know, I, I, tell the, I tell the PhD students it's like a thread. And if it, something touches you on the inside, it's a thread. Just keep pulling on it. It's going somewhere. Just keep pulling on it. What I needed was right there. I said, thank you, Holy Spirit. I remember I did all the exegesis. I consulted the original language. I read the scholars and the paper on the sermon was due and I couldn't pull it together. I was tired, exhausted, went to bed. While I was asleep, my rational mind was in a repo stage, but a thought came, the insight was delivered, the key was revealed. I got up, finished the sermon, finished the paper, said, thank you, Holy Spirit. You did not get here by yourself. You were guided here. You did not keep yourself here. Something kept you here. 
Jesus introduced them to the Holy Spirit and I call you to remember. Let me go black church again. I wish I had two or three of y'all <laughs> who could put your hands together <laughs> and give God some glory for the presence that guided you, that pulled you, that ushered you, that kept you. You wouldn't be sane right now. You'd be over in a counseling center. And you'd be over in a counseling center and say, I need to see the director. I can't see nobody. I'm in such bad shape. I need to, I, you know, I need, I need to see the top. I'm in trouble, the Holy the Spirit. Oh, and yes, yes, and the counselors rely on the Holy Spirit. So do I have one or two, three counselors in here? <laughs> I'm good. Obviously, I'm feeling comfortable with family. So let me get to this finally, lest I keep you too long. With an eventful relationship with an powerful instructor and a comforter in God, he then says to them, let us arise. Let us go hence. Classes are over. Papers have been submitted. Exams have been taken. You've completed all the necessary requirements. The time of lecture and discussion is over. Your field internship is over. Your, CP, your CPE is over. Your capstone is over. Your project has been completed. And God says, now let us arise and go hence. Commencement means an ending and even more importantly, a beginning. You were once a student, now you are trained, which means you have something you have to do. You've got something, some, something that God is calling for. It means you must go and make a difference. It means you must go and effect change. You must leave this place and do what you've been trained to do. It's application time. Go and apply what you have learned to the needs and the concerns of this world. Arise and let us go hence. A question arose as I was preparing this. Where in the world is hence? <laughs> Arise and let us go. Where, where is? In Jesus' case, hence is to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the betrayal, to being arrested, to being mocked and beaten. Hence, is a place where people make fun of you. Hence is to be mocked and beaten and spat upon, ultimately to be crucified. Hence, and I believe for us, arise and let us go hence means there's a needy world out there. Arise and go hence. Racism, rise and go hence. The gap between the rich and the poor, rise and let us go hence. They are the hurt, the depressed, the lonely out there, divided, and a selfish world is out there. A misogynistic, homophobic, trans-hating culture is out there. Arise and let us go hence. Gun cultures are out there. Gun cultures are in here. We're not even sure if somebody gonna walk in here right now and shoot this place up. I was in a restaurant last Saturday morning for my granddaughter's birthday, her fifth birthday. We were celebrating. And I looked up and I was, I looked on, you know, I'm looking for an exit just in case somebody comes in. And I was up against the window. There were no back exits. Two police officers came in, sat at the table. I said, I waved. Thank you all so much. And they said, Yo, you mighty friendly. And I said, well, I feel better with y'all here because in this culture, with these pistols and guns and AR-15s. I don't even know when I sit down with my granddaughter to celebrate her fifth birthday. Arise and let us go hence. Dying churches are out there and dying people with important positions are out there. <laughs> Arise, let us go hence. It's going to be a tough out there. It's going to be hard, y'all. I, I remember uh, uh, I, after, uh, after I got into the real world, I said, so, you know, my high school teacher lied to me. It's rough out here. <laughs> so I'm making sure I ain't lying to you. It's rough out here. <laughs> There's some Gethsemanes and some Calvaries that await you <laughs> out there. But don't worry about it. After Calvary, there is the resurrection. There's a resurrection waiting on you. Arise and let us go hence. Heartbreak and betrayal and loneliness await you. Rise, let's go. Scandalizing of your name awaits you. 
Your resurrection is after all of that. Don't forget, you're not going alone. You're going with the promise, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You're going with the promise, I will not leave you as orphans. You're going in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. You're going, arise and let us go hence. You don't go alone. The comfort of the Holy Spirit whom God will send will teach you everything and remind you of everything I taught you. Arise. My peace I leave with you. He meant arise. For every Calvary there is a resurrection. Arise because joy awaits. Arise because hope will not be defeated. Arise because love will not end. As I go to my seat. Young boy was in church with his dad, and the preacher got up and said, as I go to my seat, and the little boy leaned over his father and said, Dad, what does a preacher mean when they say go, that the preacher's going to his seat? He said, not a thing, son, not a thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> As I go to my seat. <laughs> well, tomorrow I understand, as you do, that they're giving out some degrees, and I, some, I know some of you all are getting from the School of Theology, MDivs, Doctor of Ministry degrees, Masters of Theological Studies. I know others of you from the School of Counseling, Master of Marriage and Family Therapy, or Masters of Clinical Medical, Mental Health. I know there are other ceremonies all around there in this season. You get an MS or an MBA or an MSW or JD or PhD, uh, all these you can get. My final word to you is to remember that even after you get your degree, you got one more to get. No matter how many you get. You got one more to get. One day, uh, just like tomorrow, you'll be standing in your caps and gowns with your tassels to one side. One day you're going to be standing there with a white robe as your gown with cap on your head, palm branches in your hand. One day you will not be standing there by yourself. There will be thousands upon 10,000, those from the east and the west and the north and the south. It will be a number that nobody, man or woman, can number. Somebody will ask you, who are these and where have they come from? These are they who have come through the great tribulation and wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Then President and Dean Jesus is going to arise. He says, upon the recommendation of the faculty and the board of trustees of the University of Eternity, I do confer upon you, and in this case me, Frank Anthony Thomas, the degree of WD, with all of the rights and privileges belonging to this degree in witness thereof for of this diploma granted on this everlasting day. Then Jesus is going to say, now take those tassels and turn them from the right to the left. And we're going to wave those palm branches and throw our hats and we're going to sing and shout till times get better. And somebody is going to say, what in the world is a WD? <laughs> it's called well done. Good. <laughs> and faithful. <laughs> Servant. Well done! I want to hear him say, well done! In, in Jesus' name. Amen.